This picture shows the part of the building of USSR embassy and my supervisors. On the left is Comrade Mehdi, an Indian communist, and on the right, Comrade Mitrohin, my supervisors in the secret department of research and counter-propaganda. It has nothing to do with either research or counter-propaganda. Most of the activity of that department was to compile huge amount, volume of information on individuals who were instrumental in creating public opinion. Publishers, editors, journalists, uh, actors, educationalists, professors of political science, members of parliament, uh, uh, pre uh, representatives of business circles. Most of these people were divided roughly in two groups. Those who would tow the Soviet foreign policy, they would be promoted to the positions of power through media and public opinion manipulation. Those who refused the Soviet influence in their own country would be character assassinated or executed physically come revolution. Same way as uh, in the small town of Hue in South Vietnam, several thousands of Vietnamese were executed in one night when the city was captured by Viet Cong for only two days. And American CIA could never figure out how could possibly communists know each individual where he lives, where, where to get him, and would be arrested in one night, basically in, in some four hours before dawn, put on a van, taken out of the city limits, and shot. The answer is very simple. Long before communists occupied the city, there was extensive network of informers, local Vietnamese citizens, who knew absolutely everything about people who are instrumental in public opinion, including barbers and taxi drivers. Everyone who was sympathetic to the United States was executed. Same thing was done under the guidance of, of the Soviet embassy in Hanoi, and same thing I was doing in New Delhi. To my horror, I discovered that in the files where people were doomed to execution, there were names of, of pro-Soviet journalists with whom I was personally friendly. Pro-Soviet? Yes. They were idealistically minded leftists who uh, made several visits to USSR, and yet the KGB decided that come revolution or drastic changes in political structure of India, they will have to go. Why is that? Because th they know too much. Mm -hmm. Simply because, you see, the useful idiots, the, the leftists who are idealistically believing in the beauty of Soviet socialist or communist or whatever system, when they get disillusioned, they become the worst enemies. That's why my KGB instructors specifically made the point, never bother with leftists. Forget about these political prostitutes. Aim higher. This was my instruction. Try to get into, into uh, large circulation established conservative media. Reach filthy rich movie makers, intellectuals, so-called academic circles, cynical, egocentric people who can look into your eyes with angelic expression and tell you a lie. These are the most recruitable people, people who lack moral principles, who are either too greedy or to uh, suffer from self-importance. Uh, they feel that uh, they, they matter a lot. Uh, these are the people who KGB wanted very much to recruit. But or, to eliminate the others, to execute the others, don't they serve some purpose? Wouldn't they be no, the ones they, they rely they on? They serve purpose only at the stage of destabilization of a nation. For example, your leftists in, in United States, all these professors and all these beautiful civil rights defenders, they are instrumental in the process of the, of the uh, uh, subversion only to destabilize the nation. When their job is completed, they are, non, they are not needed anymore. They know too much. Some of them, when, when they get disillusioned, when they see that Marxist-Lenin has come to power, they, obviously they get offended. They think that they will come to power. That will never happen, of course. They will be lined up against the wall and shot. But they may turn into the most bitter enemies of Marxist-Leninists when they come to power. And that's what happened in Nicaragua. You remember most of these uh, former Marxist-Leninists were either put to prison or one of them split and now he's working against Sandinistas. It happened in, in uh, uh, Grenada when Maurice Bishop was, he was already a Marxist. He was executed by, by a new Marxist who was more Marxist than this Marxist. Same happened in Afghanistan when uh, first there was Taraki, he was killed by Amin, then Amin was killed by Babrak Karman with the help of KGB. Same happened in, in Bangladesh when Mujibur Rahman, very pro-Soviet leftist, was assassinated by his own Marxist-Leninist military comrades. 
It's the same pattern everywhere. The moment they serve their purpose, all the useful idiots are used, either be executed entirely, all the idealistically minded Marxists, or uh, uh, exiled or put in prisons, like in Cuba. Many, many former Marxists are in Cuba, I mean in prison. So most of the Indians who were cooperating with the Soviets, especially without uh, a de department of, of uh, information of the USSR embassy, were listed for execution. Uh, and when I discovered that fact, of course I was sick. I was mentally and physically sick. I thought that I, I'm going to explode one day during the briefing at the ambassador's office. I would stand up and say something that we are basically a bunch of murderers. That's what we are. We, it has nothing to do with friendship and understanding between the nation and blah, blah, blah. We are murderers. We behave as a bunch of thugs in, in a country which, which is hospitable to us, a country which, which, with ancient traditions. But I, I, I did not defect. I tried to get the message across to my horror. Nobody wanted even to listen, least of all to believe what I had to say. And I tried all kinds of tricks. I would, I would, I would uh, leak information through letters uh, or lost documents or something like that. And still I got no message. Uh, the message was not published even in the conservative mass media of, of India. The immediate impulse to defect was Bangladesh crisis, which was described by American correspondents as Islamic grassroots revolution, which is absolute baloney. Uh, there was nothing to do with Islam, and there was no grassroots revolution. Actually, there are no grassroots revolutions, period. Any revolution is a byproduct of a highly organized group uh, of conscientious and professional um, um, organizers, but has nothing to do with grassroots. In Bangladesh, it was nothing with grassroots. Most of the uh, Avami League party members, Avami League means People's Party, uh, were trained in Moscow in the high party school. Most of the Mukti Fauj leaders, Mukti Fauj in Bengali means People's Army, same as SWAPO and, and all kind of liberation armies all over the world, the same bunch of useful idiots. They were trained at Lumumba University and various centers of the KGB in Simferopol, in, in Crimea, and in Tashkent. So when I saw that India, Indian territory is being used as a, as a jumping board to destroy East Pakistan, I saw myself thousands of, of so-called students traveling through India to East Pakistan, through the territory of India, and Indian government pretended not to see what was going on. They knew perfectly well. The Indian police knew it. The intelligence department of Indian government knew it. The KGB, of course, knew it. And the CIA knew it. That, that was most infuriating because when I defected and I explained to the CIA debriefers they should watch out because East Pakistan is going to erupt any moment. They said I, 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 was, I was reading too, too many James Bond novels. Anyway, so East Pakistan was doomed. Uh, one of my colleagues in, in the Soviet consulate in Calcutta, when he was dead drunk, he ventured into the basement to, to relieve himself and he found the big boxes which said printed matter to Dhaka University. Dhaka is the capital of East Pakistan. And since he was drunk and curious, he opened one of the boxes and he discovered not printed matter. He discovered Kalashnikov guns and ammunition in there. Anyway, it's a long story. When I saw the, the preparations for the, for the uh, invasion into East Pakistan, obviously I wanted to defect immediately. The only thing I couldn't, I couldn't at that time uh, make up my mind when and where and how. One of the reasons, of course, you see, I was in love with India. I mentioned that before. I spoke the languages. I socialized with people. And I understood that I had to, to act fast unless I want this beautiful country to be permanently and irreparably damaged by our presence. One of the reasons not to defect was, as you can see, I was living in relative affluence. Who the hell in, in, in the normal mind would defect and do what? To be abused by your media? To be called McCarthyist and fascist and paranoid? Or to drive a taxi in New York City? What for? What the hell for should I defect? To be abused by, by Americans? To be insulted in exchange for, for my effort to bring the truthful information about impending danger of subversion? As you can see, I was living in quite a comfortable conditions next to swimming pool where Indians were not allowed, by the way. I was highly paid expert in propaganda. I had my family. I was respected by my nation. M my career was cloudless. 
The third reason, how to defect with the family. To defect with the baby and the wife would be virtual suicide because uh, according to law, that hypocritical law which I quoted before, the Indian police will have to hand me over back to the KGB and that will be the end of my defection and probably my life. Again, I cannot smuggle my wife because she was not quite sure what, what I was doing. She was not that idealistically involved and she was definitely not in, in, in the total picture of what I was doing for the KGB. She would be shocked if I, if I uh, you know, put her in my van and, and drive her to an American embassy or elsewhere. That would be a greatest danger. So again, I had to defect in such a way that my defection would look as simple disappearance. And there were many cases like that when the Soviet agents simply disappeared, either killed in action or thanks to their curiosity and, and their close contacts with radicals. Some of them were killed by the Marxists, by the way. It happened in many African countries when the Soviet KGB were killed by Africans themselves. Not because they hated Marxism-Leninism, but because they were simply trigger-happy bunch of unruly characters. If you give them a machine gun, they will shoot. And some of the Soviets obviously were not careful enough to protect themselves. And they got into embarrassing situations when they were shot at the crossfire between factions of, of so-called liberation movements. Anyway, so I, I decided, as I said, to study the um, counterculture. I decided this probably would be the best way to disappear. I socialized with characters like this on the left. You see, he's a barefoot American hippie. Uh, it took me quite a long time to study exactly what they were doing and how to mix with them. But eventually I did it. Most of Indian newspapers carried my picture and promise of 2,000 rupees for information about my whereabouts. But they were looking for wrong person because they obviously tried to stop a young Soviet diplomat in white shirt and tie. And th this is how I looked at the time of defection. Nobody could possibly think that a Soviet diplomat would be as crazy as to join a bunch of hippies. That's you. Tra yes, travel yeah. India and smoke hush. So I made it literally as, as almost like a Hollywood style uh, detective story uh, from under the nose of the KGB in Bombay airport I landed the plane and I flew to to Greece where I was debriefed by the CIA